War is one of the greatest follies of mankind. For a species so intelligent, resorting to such primal means to get our way, it could be considered a disgrace to the collective being that is humanity. Though it is something we fall back upon time and time again. We strive to perfect it even. We even name bombs as royalty among explosives. As such with the Tsar Bomba. The Tsar meaning king. The king of bombs. While the destructive capabilities of such creations are something to inspire nightmares and general unrest amongst the world, the truly frightening aspect of war comes not from weaponry such as bombs and artillery, but the invitation to do the unthinkable. An invitation to experiment on the helpless without concern. In this dark world of ours, even the worst of atrocities can be justified in wartime. The country of Japan has changed drastically over the last century. What was once a nation striving to be the strongest force in the Eastern world has become a nation that detests war, having no armed forces for invasion, along with taking strict protocols to ensure that the events from World War II never see the light of day again. The former Empire of Japan is notorious for some of the worst war crimes the world has seen, such as the Bataan Death March, the Rape of Nanking, and the one that will be the topic for today, Unit 731. The tragedy of Unit 731 begins not with World War II, but with the start of the Second Sino-Japanese War. Japan was already setting its eyes upon expansion into mainland China. With a small foothold in China after the occupation of Manchuria, they were set to conquer more of the Eastern world. Japan had various reasons to begin their expansion into China. The primary reason was a lack of resources, but the cheap labor they could get from the locals, along with the morale boost the captured comfort women would provide to the Japanese military. It seemed like a no-brainer for the empire at the time to expand their territory. Japan's goal, after all, was to be the strongest force in the eastern world. And according to Japanese legend, the current reigning emperor, Hirohito, was a descendant from the great sun god Amaterasu. He was a walking god among the men, and destined to lead not only Japan, but the world. This philosophy was instilled into the very well-being of the Japanese public. Everything was for the emperor and the great Japanese race. This ideology made it easy to see anyone besides the Japanese as beneath them. Shiro Ishii, the man who would helm Unit 731, as well as Japan's biological warfare facilities, would be raised with this philosophy. Shiro was born into a wealthy family, and graduated near top of his class at Kyoto University. Shiro was considered an odd man during his school years. He seemed to have a general disregard for people, and referred to the bacteria he raised as pets. Though he mainly dealt with biology, he was astounded by the use of chemical weapons during World War I, and felt that the Japanese military was weaker for not having such technology in their grasp. 1932, though, he would be chosen to lead the Biological Warfare Development Unit, with him being in a position of power, Japan having a foothold in China, and all the resources he needed, Shiro would see a golden opportunity before him. An unlimited supply of human test subjects. In 1935, the buildings that housed the infamous actions of Unit 731 were built. The local Chinese would be rounded up, a mixture of local prisoners, prisoners of war, and even innocent civilians who were tricked into coming to the camp, usually being promised employment. Some reports claimed that the secret police would round up people at night, accusing them of suspicious activity. Afterwards, they'd be shipped to Unit 731 in cargo trucks. Those unfortunate enough to find themselves within the walls of Unit 731 would no longer be considered human. All men, women, and children who were not faculty from now on would be called Maruta. 
The word translated meaning logs. This played into what the Japanese government wanted the locals to think of the factory. It was known as a lumber mill to nearby occupants. People would be subjugated to various diseases, forcefully infected with things such as tuberculosis, anthrax, or the bubonic plague, more commonly known as the Black Death. They would be left to suffer from these ailments with little to no medical attention. The scientists studying how it affected the body, eventually most of them would receive a vivisection, or in other words, they were dissected alive. This was commonly done for fear that the decomposition process would likely mess with the test results. Almost all of these operations was done without anesthesia. Organs would be removed and study in front of them while they lied on the table in agony. There's reports that some of the patients would have their stomachs removed and their esophagus would be reattached to their intestines. As well, limbs would be amputated and then reattached on the opposite side of the body. Sometimes the doctors would simply cut someone open, take a chunk of someone's lung or other various organs, and see how the person reacted, monitoring if they could still function with a vital piece missing. I think the more disturbing aspect, though, is that with a bit of research, you will find that vivisection was not just being practiced in Unit 731. The Japanese were prone to performing vivisections all throughout World War II. Alongside bacterial testing, one study was trying to get a better grasp of frostbite, what it did to the body, ways to treat it, and how long it takes to get frostbitten in the first place. To do this, certain prisoners would have their arms or legs forcefully held under freezing cold water, up until the point that the limb was frozen solid. A small test would be conducted afterwards. They'd smack the limb with a cane, and if the sound that came off sounded similar to that of hitting a plank of wood, they'd be taken away from the water and then various tests would be conducted. The ice surrounding the limb would be hacked away, and then Yoshimura Hisato, the lead scientist, would do a number of things to the subject. Sometimes he'd hold the limb close to an open flame and see how long it would take to dethaw. Other times, scalding hot water would then be poured across the appendage. Or he and the staff would just wait and watch to see how long it would take for the limb to just naturally rot away. Children were not far from testing as well. Even infants were prone to experimentation. Women would be forcefully impregnated, alongside being infected with STDs such as syphilis. This usually being done by taking an infected individual and placing them with someone who wasn't, forcing them to be together at gunpoint. Apparently, it was more cost-effective to do this rather than inject the disease into someone. Afterwards, some of the women would be dissected at various stages of the infection. Other times, though, they'd let the women give birth to a child, and the scientists would study the child and mother. There are multiple reports of women having as many as up to four or five kids in the facility. Others, sadly, only got a few months into their pregnancy before they found themselves on Shiro Ishii's bisection table. Though Unit 731 was primarily made to study bacterial and biological ailments and treatments, they would be host to weapon experiments as well. People would be tied up to posts and have explosives detonated close by to them. This was a means to study how shrapnel affected the body, and facilitate the best ways of removing it. People would be torched with flamethrowers or shot with artillery, even bombed in some instances. Study was the primary concern of Shiro Ishii, though. He still needed a way to militarize his findings. They were in the middle of World War II, after all. 
He would conduct various experiments with fleas that would be able to transmit the bubonic plague or other various diseases. They would be loaded up into planes and dropped onto the local populace. After a short while, scientists would arrive in protective gear to study the afflicted, as well to check up how quickly the plague spread. These local towns had no idea what was going on in the area, but I am sure many had their suspicions. With the data collected from the flea experiments in local cities, along with testing of how to deploy them properly, Shiro Ishii would be able to spread its disease overseas to mainland US. The operation was called Cherry Blossoms at Night. Thousands of disease-ridden fleas would be dropped on San Diego, California. It was set to take place on September 22nd, 1945, only two weeks after the Japanese had surrendered. The war was over shortly after the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The Japanese surrendered and much of Unit 731 was set to be destroyed. All of the evidence was to be burned, the captives were slaughtered, the crew would quickly cover up as much as they could and flee back to Japan. One report states that Ishii told his battalion to take the secret to the grave, and that he'd find anyone who spoke up on the matter. Unit 731 was quickly discovered, not by the public, but by the US government. With a Cold War looming on the horizon, this could give them a one-up on their future enemy. A deal would be struck shortly thereafter. A general by the name of Douglas MacArthur would give all of the scientists of Unit 731 immunity. In trade, they would give all of their findings to the United States, and the United States alone. Most of the scientists would go on to continue with their work, some even being employed by the US government. Never again. Those words tend to define the Holocaust. We must never repeat such grave atrocities. Though I feel those words go farther than just the Holocaust. World War II was tragic for almost every nation involved. Not just for the lives that were lost, but the stances that people took. Almost everyone involved in Unit 731 walked away a free man. Over 3,000 men, women, children, and even newborns were killed, with some reports stating that upwards of 400,000 more died from plague testing in the local areas. They got away free. Shiro Ishii lived a long and full life, dying of throat cancer, only being 69 years old. Unit 731, the Holocaust, and the deal the US government gave just for the test results. These are all vile acts of themselves. Vile acts that must never be repeated. Never again. Hey guys, thanks for watching another video. You can find a link to Lucas King's SoundCloud as well as my Yuji's down below. I'm sure if you consistently watch these, you're gonna become well acquainted with their music. I'm sorry for the bit of a delay that came out with this video. Honestly, I got a little bit sidetracked in my personal life, so I honestly squandered a couple days. I hope you all enjoyed. Feel free to like, share, subscribe, dislike, anything really. But comments are the most appreciated. I'll be looking forward to seeing you guys again soon.